Your smartphone today has over a million times more computing power than NASA had when it sent astronauts to the moon in 1969. Let that sink in for a bit. This is possible because there has been an exponential increase in computing power over time. If the same exponential trend was applied to the automotive industry, then a typical family sedan 20 years ago would today have the same horsepower as a large passenger jet engine. What pushed this exponential trend was that scientists and engineers manufactured ever smaller transistors, the basic building block of modern computer chips. And nanotechnology has been at the forefront of this push for about the past 20 years. What is the science that makes this all possible? Stay tuned to find out. Greetings, Earthlings. Welcome to Science Fictionally True. On this channel, we talk about the real science, technology, and history behind science fiction topics. In this video, we'll deep dive into how nanotechnology is being used to improve our lives with its applications in electronics. This is a field known as nanoelectronics. First, we'll talk about how nanotechnology enabled computing power to get so powerful so quickly in a phenomenon known as Moore's Law. Second, we'll discuss how nanotechnology has also improved our data storage solutions. Lastly, we'll discuss how nanotechnology has revolutionized display technologies and has given us better color TV. If you're unfamiliar with nanotechnology, then I recommend you checking out a previous video I made going over the basics before watching this one. Most practitioners define nanoelectronics as electronic devices which contain components with feature lengths under 100 nanometers. But why would we care about making things smaller? Because achieving smaller feature lengths means you can cram more electronic components into the same amount of area, which leads to improved computer processors, memory, storage, and display technologies. Basically improved everything. Some people think nanotechnology is the stuff of science fiction. However, the semiconductor industry has been releasing products with feature lengths of under 100 nanometers since 2003. Today, the world's three largest semiconductor manufacturers, Intel, Samsung, and Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company, have manufacturing processes capable of achieving feature lengths in the single-digit nanometer range. And photolithography is the key component of this shrinkage. The photolithography process is similar to film photography for those old enough to remember. During photolithography, a thin film of photoresist is placed on a slab of silicon. Then, a pattern is exposed onto the photoresist using ultraviolet light, and the photoresist is developed using photographic chemicals. Unwanted photoresist is washed away, leaving a resist layer of the desired pattern on the silicon. This patterned resist layer preps the silicon for subsequent process steps, allowing engineers to create intricate patterns on it. Therefore, how fine an electronic component's features can be is dictated by how advanced the lithography process is. Many semiconductor companies benchmark how advanced their computing processing units or CPUs are by citing the minimum transistor feature lengths. CPUs are the brains of any modern day computer. The basic computing component in CPUs are transistors. You can spend years studying the inner workings of transistors in college. Unfortunately, we won't have that much time to cover it in depth in these videos, so we'll just go over the topic at a very high level. Each transistor is essentially a switch, not unlike a light switch on your wall. It can be in an on state or an off state. The image shown is a cross-sectional image of what a single planar transistor looks like. This was the dominant transistor architecture used for a while. If a voltage is applied to the gate, which is made of an insulating material, current can flow between the source and the drain. This puts the transistor in the on state. If no voltage is applied to the gate, then current cannot flow between the source and the drain, and the transistor is in the off state. And if you have enough transistors working in unison, your CPU can compute. Today, it is not uncommon to see CPUs with transistor counts in the tens of billions. By shrinking the minimum feature size, semiconductor manufacturers can increase the transistor density in their CPUs, 
which means more computing power crammed in the same amount of space. At the time this video was created, Intel's most advanced transistor design available on the market uses its FinFET technology, which debuted in 2012. This was the first time the semiconductor industry used a three-dimensional transistor design. The conductive channel is a fin shape covered by insulating material. Moving forward, Intel has already announced plans on RibbonFET, their next generation transistor design. RibbonFET technology features a stack of nano ribbons that will allow a greater on current with a smaller footprint as compared to a transistor with multiple fins. Intel plans on releasing products to the market with RibbonFET technology as early as 2024. This trend of transistor shrinkage has been going on for decades and underpins our exponential increase in computing power. The trend is so important that there is even a name for it, Moore's Law. Moore's Law states that computing power doubles about every two years due to shrinking transistor sizes. To be clear, Moore's Law is a law of economics, not a physical law of nature like the laws of thermodynamics. It was named after Gordon Moore, a co-founder of Intel, for being the first to observe the trend in 1965. In the decades that followed his original observation, Moore's Law guided the semiconductor industry in long-term planning and setting targets for research and development. Moore's Law has been a driving force of technological and social change, productivity, and economic growth that are hallmarks of the late 20th and early 21st centuries. Many industry experts are concerned that Moore's Law will finally come to an end soon Minimum feature lengths today are already so small that continual shrinkage means feature lengths will soon only be a few atoms across. This presents some big challenges for engineers in the semiconductor industry. Firstly, from a physics perspective, if you have feature lengths that small, electrons can easily quantum tunnel through barriers. In transistors, electrons quantum tunneling through the gate was a concern. These leakage currents make an individual transistor less energy efficient and causes greater degradation to the transistor over time. If you have 10 billion of these transistors in your device, like many modern CPUs do, this becomes a huge problem. Secondly, economics is making research and development needed to continue Moore's Law more difficult. There is a lesser known law in the industry called Rock's Law, also known as Moore's Second Law which states the cost of a semiconductor fabrication plant doubles every four years. These exponentially rising costs are driven by higher manufacturing complexities at smaller length scales. The Semiconductor Industry Association, a trade association representing the U.S. semiconductor industry, estimated that a state-of-the-art plant in 2020 can cost up to 20 billion U.S. dollars to build. For these reasons, people are concerned there are days of exponentially increasing computing power Maybe soon over. Luckily, scientists and engineers working in the industry have some clever methods to extend the demise of Moore's Law. Extreme Ultraviolet Photolithography, or EUV, is a technology that debuted recently and promises to extend transistor shrinkage into the upcoming decade. In photolithography, the photoresist layer is exposed to UV light to print patterns onto the layer, and shorter wavelengths of UV light mean finer features can be imprinted. Over the decades, photolithography technology went from wavelengths of 365 nanometers to 248 nanometers to 193 nanometers. The debut of EUV technology making a jump from 193 nanometers all the way down to 13.5 nanometers. Research and development in EUV started back in 1986, and after decades of scientific and technical breakthroughs, Dutch semiconductor equipment manufacturer, ASML, debuted the technology. The hardware needed to enable this is extremely large, convoluted, and expensive, costing about 150 million US dollars just for one machine. Shipment of just one of ASML's EUV machines requires 40 freight containers spread over 20 trucks and three cargo planes. Industry experts believe EUV technology allows Moore's Law to continue to about 2030. So it looks like Moore's Law dodged the bullet for now, and only time will tell how long it can keep going. CPUs aren't the only kind of electronics that has benefited from nanotechnology. Computer storage systems, particularly solid-state drives or SSDs, have benefited greatly from the ability to produce ever smaller feature lengths. To understand how SSDs work 
and why nanotechnology is beneficial, we need to first understand how information is encoded and stored. All data in modern computers can be represented by a series of binary bits, so basically a series of zeros and ones. Consider an image stored on your computer. If you zoom in very closely, you'll see that the image is comprised of an array of pixels. Each pixel has a color that can be defined as a composite of the colors red, green, and blue, or RGB, at varying intensities. Each R, G, and B value is a number between 0 and 255, which can be represented by a string of 8 binary bits. And when you store this image on your computer, you're just getting your hardware to remember a series of binary numbers in the correct order. So, how do you get the SSD to remember? Here is where nanotechnology plays a role. An SSD is made of silicon chips that contain dense arrays of memory cells. Each memory cell is essentially what we call a charge trap flash. In many modern day SSDs, each charge trap uses different levels of electron charge to represent three bits of information. Now, how do you fill a charge trap flash with charge? A schematic of a charge trap flash is shown on the screen. The channel acts as a source of electrons. The tunnel oxide, a dielectric material, separates the channel and the charge trap. The blocking oxide, another dielectric, separates the charge trap from the gate. Dielectrics act as barriers that electrons have difficulty passing. When a voltage is applied to the gate region, an electric field pulls the electrons from the channel towards the gate. The physics of what happens here is quite complicated and we'll only have time for a high level explanation in this video. The electric field effectively decreases the barrier widths the electrons feel. If the right amount of voltage is applied, electrons in the channel can quantum tunnel through the tunnel oxide into the charge trap. We already talked about quantum tunneling in a previous video, so please check it out if you're new to this concept. Once they're in the charge trap, electrons remain there until we do something to get them out. Because quantum tunneling sensitively depends on the barrier width, scientists and engineers needed to carefully design and construct these structures for all this to work. If the dielectric walls are too thick, the required gate voltage needs to be higher to trigger quantum tunneling, which means more damage to the memory cell. However, if the dielectric walls are too thin, then there is a high chance that electrons in the trap can quantum tunnel out of it. This results in your data being corrupted, causing the SSD to forget. In modern SSDs, the channel is about 20 nanometers wide, the tunnel oxide is about 8 nanometers wide, the charge trap is about 16 nanometers wide, and the blocking oxide is about 16 nanometers wide. This precise design allows charges to be safely trapped for about a decade of inactivity before your files may become corrupt. Also, the act of putting and removing electrons from the trap damages the memory cell. This limits the amount of write and erase cycles in SSDs. That's why they say you should always back up your important files in multiple locations. We talked a lot about how nanotechnology helped improve computers, but it's improving our televisions and monitors too. One particular technology that's attracted a lot of attention recently is quantum dot light emitting diodes, or QLEDs for short. Quantum dots are semiconducting nano-sized spherical particles with diameters usually ranging from 2 to 10 nanometers. So how does this all work? The science behind quantum dots can get pretty complicated, but we'll try to use simple models and analogies to illustrate as we've done in the past. To first understand how light is generated in quantum dots, we need to first understand how it's generated in bulk semiconductor materials used in traditional LEDs. The highest energy electrons in the material will occupy the valence band, which is a collection of high energy states. The next highest allowed energy states are in the conduction band, there is an energy gap between the valence and conduction bands, called the band gap, that is dependent on the material's properties. If you give an electron in the valence band enough energy, it can excite and occupy the conduction band. When excited electrons eventually relax, they emit light, and the color of that light will be proportional to the band gap energy. Traditional LED device structures allows you to apply a voltage to force conduction band electrons to relax and emit light. So, what makes quantum dots special, and why is there an advantage to using them? Well, it turns out that the band gap energy is tunable and becomes size dependent on the nanoscale. If you make your semiconductor small enough, 
Changing the particle size allows you to finely tune the color of emitted light, instead of relying on the material properties alone. This happens because of a phenomenon called the quantum confinement effect. In bulk materials, electrons have lots of room to move around. However, in quantum dots, the electrons have much less room to roam around and feel squeezed. The result is that the energy levels between the valence and conduction band increases. So, you can finely tune the color of emitted light by changing the size of your quantum dot. The picture shown are vials of quantum dots made to fluoresce in different colors. Most people were introduced to the term quantum dot through Samsung's QLED TVs, which debuted in 2017. QLED displays use a blue LED backlight to excite a layer of quantum dots. When the excited electrons in those quantum dots relax, they emit a sharp, crisp color. The quantum dot emitted light then travels through a few more layers to create the final image you see on the screen. Many people wonder how QLED technology compares to its competitors. Does nanotechnology really give it an edge? Or is the quantum in QLED just a marketing gimmick? So no, it's not just a marketing gimmick. QLED displays do really use quantum dots to create a better image. And compared to their main competitor, organic light emitting diode or OLED technology, QLED has better power efficiency and can produce sharper colors. However, when it comes to image quality, OLED has QLED B. This is because OLED is emissive technology, whereas QLED is transmissive technology. QLED's transmissive technology means the light from the LED source needs to be transmitted through the layers to the screen's surface. On the other hand, OLED doesn't use a backlight to create the image. Instead, the OLED pixels themselves emit the desired colored light. Therefore, unused OLED pixels can be completely turned off to create black on the screen which results in better black levels and contrast compared to QLED. So which one is better? Well, at the time this video was created, the best displays on the market are QD OLEDs, which stand for Quantum Dot Light Emitting Diode, debuted by Samsung in 2022. These displays use both QLED and OLED technology, giving consumers the best of both worlds. QD OLED panels use blue OLED material as the basis of each pixel. That blue OLED pixel is then divided into three sub-pixels. A blue sub-pixel, which is the original blue OLED material left unchanged, a red sub-pixel that uses red-tuned quantum dots, and a green sub-pixel that uses green-tuned quantum dots. Since quantum dots are so energy efficient, virtually no brightness is lost in those two color transformations. The result? QD OLED technology is brighter and more colorful than regular OLED technology while also allowing for superior black and contrast levels. We've seen how nanotechnology has improved our electronics through the miniaturization of components and the exploitation of quantum effects. So what's next to come? Well, there's many scientists and engineers leveraging existing electronics manufacturing technology and nanoscience research to drive the field forward. Some exciting research being done includes flexible electronics, biocompatible electronics, and even nanobots, just to name a few things. However, only time will tell when or if any of these exciting new technologies come to market. Thanks for watching, Earthlings. In my next video, we'll discuss how nanotechnology is revolutionizing medicine. Thanks, and see you all next time.